Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to my September um, reading wrapper. Dane reads. So I've just got the one book to talk to you about, and that is Fantastic Voyage 2, Destination Brain by Isaac Asimov. So I read Fantastic Voyage 1 <laughs> uh, last month. Um, because I thought maybe you need to read the first book before the second book. Turns out not really. Basically the first book is Asimov writing a novelisation of like a popular film from the 60s which I have since watched. I thought the novelisation was better than the film. However in my mind it goes Fantastic Voyage novelisation is the best, then Fantastic Voyage the movie, then Fantastic Voyage 2 Destination Brain is the worst. Even though Asimov himself said he preferred working on this one because basically when he was writing the novelization all the plot and everything was done for him whereas this one he could just do himself but it's not really necessary it's not even a sequel it's like a reinterpretation of it and the problem is like you get 200 pages in or so before they even get to the point of the novel so basically the point of the novel uh, this one and Fantastic Voyage 1 there's a guy who's in a coma and um, there's miniaturization technology the Soviets and the US are like competing with this miniaturization technology and basically a bunch of people need to be shrunk down into like a little ship that can be injected into somebody go inside and fix them up and all that get them out of the coma um, now I will say as well this plot has just been done to death since this came out as well I mean I imagine this is where it all originated but the problem is, is with the movie and the first novelization, they're going into the guy's brain to fix like a blood clot that can't be operated on. Which is like, okay, fair enough. In this one, they're going into his brain to try and read his thoughts. And it's like, mate, you, you, you know, <laughs> like you're pushing the, the limits of believability by shrinking people down and injecting them into a bloodstream. If you're now trying to tell me that they're doing that in order to read his thoughts, Nah, it doesn't work, especially with like all of the stuff like this, loads of stuff about like Planck's constant and all of this stuff, and uh, what's its name, I've tapped it out over here, um, Brownian motion, that's it, Brownian motion is when, when you're so small, particles are like constantly bombarding us, and when you're so small, the particles are basically large enough to jiggle you about, you know, so they shrink down so much that the Brownian motion means that the particles that hit the ship are like making it vibrate and stuff. So it's like all of that is really cool, really cool physics stuff. And then they, they're going to try and read someone's mind. No, nah, it didn't work for me. So this one, it was also too long. As I say, it takes 200 pages of setup, whereas the novelization of the movie took like 20 pages of setup. So this has about the same amount of time dedicated to the Fantastic Voyage, except it's then double the length because it also has more time setting it up than it does on the actual voyage. It's very bizarre. So I didn't think it really worked. I gave it a weak, well no, I'll give it a strong three out of five, but not good for Asimov at all, which is a shame. Um, but yeah, hey ho, a reading wrap up. So I've just got the one book to talk to you about at the moment. That is The Jesus Incident by Frank Herbert and Bill Ransom. Um, this book was a bit nuts, to be honest. Uh, it's like sci-fi, but then with religious like parallels. And I'm not particularly religious, so I feel as though a lot of it went over my head. A lot of, like the specifics of the sci-fi world building and stuff also kind of went over my head. Um, they're on board a ship and they worship the ship. Uh, I'll give you the blurb here because it's very short. Uh, a small group of human colonists are engaged in a desperate struggle for survival ranged against them. The planet Pandora its native life forms as malevolent and savage as they are numerous and ship their shipboard computer, who knows that it is God, and, on pain of destruction, demands their worship. A giant of a novel, vast in its conception, cosmic in scope, universal in theme. Uh, with this mad image at the front, there's a bit, at some point they like reenact the crucifixion. There's just all kinds of crazy stuff happening in here. Actually though, as you can see, I didn't really tab much out of it for my review. I don't even know if I'm gonna do a review, because I don't know if there's enough, but I might give it a go. Um, it's one of those books where I feel like I would need to read this at least two or three more times just to understand everything and possibly you're going to have to read this like six times if you want to have like a coherent full review going into all of the nitty gritty. And um, what I will say is there's a, like the sections on it are quite short and each of them are kicked off with like a quote so I tapped out a lot of those quotes because <laughs> those were some of the best bits and like references to Frankenstein and this and that. You're all very, you know, cool. I gave it like a middle of the road 3.5 out of 5. Hello everybody, just the one book to talk to you about today, that is The Crucible by Arthur Miller. This is the Penguin Modern Classics edition. It is a play, it's about uh, the Salem Witch Trials essentially. There's a really interesting mix as well because as well as the play, 
there are kind of notes on each of the characters um, and also some of it's taken from like historical fact and in other ways like you kind of can't you know there's not enough information about the people involved in it to extrapolate their full personality so obviously Miller had to take some liberties with it but I was very impressed with it um, very well written very thought-provoking and it says here um, it's uh, yeah, it draws parallels between Salem witch hunt and McCarthyism um, which again, I don't know a huge amount of McCarthyism but um, you can definitely see like I, I guess it's you know there's parallels between the Salem witch hunt and anything today that we think of as a witch hunt as well you know you hear it in the media all the time witch hunt about so and so um, and it just kind of addresses that like mob mentality that happens um, lots of really stunning lines in it as well uh, my friend Charlie of Nidge and Charlie, so I basically know Nidge better to be honest, he's a sound guy, a local sound guy, and Charlie is his better half, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that, <laughs> and um, she saw that I posted this on my Instagram when I, when I hold it, and she said it was one of her favourite plays, I can totally see why, um, I think other than, the only play that I've read recently that really kind of stacks up against this is um, the one with Brick in it, what was it called, Cat on a Hot Tin Reef, uh, that was really good as well. Um, and I think that both of them are like, you know, quarterly favourites for sure. So I gave The Crucible by Arthur Miller 4.5 out of 5. Full review coming soon. Hello everybody, I've got a good few books to wrap up for you today as you can see. Uh, the first one I should talk about as well, I think it was called Reality Sandwiches. It was an Allen Ginsberg poetry collection. Uh, I've already done my review of that, so the book's actually packed, ready to go to my new house. Um, but that was quite good, 3.5 out of 5. There are only like three poems that I really picked up on as individual poems that I love, but it was very typical of Ginsberg's work, so there was that, did enjoy. Just seeing if I'm blurry, am I blurry? I think I'm all right. Uh, then I read Callie Trench, 105 artist Tans, Touch Tell Create. So uh, she's a local artist, she did a project where she photographed a bunch of artists' hands, put this into this uh, really nice little um, like art book with some essays and stuff comments by the artists, all that good stuff, and lots of stuff on the subject of hands. So, review of that coming soon, 3.5 out of 5. I've started my review of this, this is another 3.5 out of 5, but quite a strong one. This is Refugee Boy by Benjamin Zephaniah. So, with Zephaniah, um, he can be quite hit and miss for me, and uh, I've read a bunch of his books, and then I picked up Gangster Rap, and I was hating it so much that I DNF'd it, and took Zephaniah off the list of authors who I want to read all of the books by. Then I saw this in a charity shop and picked it up, did enjoy this one. Um, it's basically about a boy called Alem whose parents are, one is, uh, uh, one is Eritrean and one is Ethiopian. And it was set at the time where Eritrea and Ethiopia were at war. So this kid ends up kind of coming to the UK with his dad for a holiday and then his dad leaves him there and basically makes him um, seek asylum. So very hard hitting stuff. It's kind of young adult but the kind of stuff that's really important to exist, you know. Okay, then we have Five Go Bump in the Night by Enid Blyton, although it's actually by Bruno Vincent. This is one of the famous five books for adults, very funny. Um, you'll particularly like this if you're a bookish person, because there are kind of... It's one of, those, it's one of those books where it's got stories within stories. So it kind of takes the form of they're all camping, I think, and uh, they're telling each other ghost stories. And, um, you know, they're like... It's a bit like the Treehouse of Horror Simpsons episodes. Um, so they kind of parody famous works like um, um, Jekyll and Hyde was in here, Frankenstein I think, uh, the picture of Dorian Gray was definitely in here. Overall this one was probably a 4 out of 5, did enjoy, very funny. Then we have William Shakespeare's The Clome Army Attacketh by Ian Dersha. So this is, uh, Ian Dersha writes plays that are Shakespearean style but based on Star Wars, although he's also done much ado about Mean Girls, which I want to get to, and Get Thee Back to the Future. There's a lot of fun, there's a lot of little nods to this, so for example Jar Jar Binks, he speaks his usual nonsense when other people are around, but when he's the only one on stage he can address the audience directly and speak to a normal person. Yoda speaks in haiku, uh, a few of the characters like I think Anakin and Padme speak in rhyming couplets to you know, reference the romance there. So all in all pretty good, it's also got the tagline, to shmi or not to shmi, that is the question, which is a great tagline. 3.5 out of 5, but only because I don't, you know, it's not my favourite of the Star Wars movies, so... He did his best with the source material. And then we have two books by Frank Herbert. So we have Heretics of Dune, uh, 3.5 out of 5, and then Chapter House Dune, 3 out of 5. These are books 5 and 6 in the Dune series. Um, basically, Heretics of Dune for me marked a bit of a turning point where it started to lose itself a bit. And by the time we get to Chapter House Dune, it's just like ticking the boxes. It actually felt as though the Dune universe itself was in decline. Um, 
and it's the end of the original series of books as well, so I don't know whether that was deliberate or not, but yeah, uh, Heretics of Dune was much more engaging, Chapter House Dune was, it was just like a lot of world building. I also had my problem with Chapter House was that you, you get used to there being these huge time periods between each of the books. So by the time you get to Chapter House Dune, you don't want to invest in any of the characters because you know they're all going to be dead by the next book anyway. Because there's going to be like 1500 years pass by or whatever. But um, yeah, both alright. And now I've finished reading all of the Frank Herbert Dune books. So now I need to move on to the ones by Brian Herbert, his son. Although I think he co-wrote them with Kevin J. Anderson. And I've read Anderson before because he did some of the Star Wars novelizations. Hello people of the internet, I have three books to wrap up for you today. The first is The Fall by Albert Camus. Uh, this is the English translation, although I am also, I do have the French translation, so I'm going to read that next. I just read it in English first so I can understand the French, I guess. Um, but yeah, this basically takes the form of a monologue from this Parisian lawyer, and um, yeah, he's talking to a guy in a bar in Amsterdam about his life, and he calls himself, uh, what is it, a judge penitent. Um, and there's just a lot of like philosophical shit in it, it's really good. Um, I think um, Attention here on YouTube is going to be doing a discussion on it soon, which is why I picked it up. I'm going to be doing a review as well, although I didn't pick out a huge amount to tab out of it. But yeah, excellent stuff. Then I read Asterix et les Normands par Argassini et Adair, so c'est un bon dessinaire, un livre graphique. A uh, graphic novel on anglais, and uh, it was a lot of fun, c'était très drôle. Uh, Quel numéro dans la série a-t-il? Je ne sais pas. I don't know, we're like number nine in the series, I think. Something like that. Uh, and I plan to just keep on slowly reading them. This has the Normans in it. It wasn't as good as some of the other ones, actually. So this one was just like a 3.5 out of 5, but I'm glad I ticked it off. Uh, and then I read Congo by Michael Crichton. Michael Crichton obviously being the author of Jurassic Park. This book was nuts. Um, they head off into the Congo. Um, to try and find some diamonds, like specific diamonds that can be used for technology. Like, there's, the technology in this is like laughably outdated because it was kind of trying to be futuristic but it was written in like the late 70s I think. And there's like a reference to the internet um, or what would, essentially an idea that the internet kind of fits into. But somebody said it wasn't possible because there wasn't enough metal on the earth. There's also an ape in this who can do sign language who parachutes from a plane. So that tells you how bonkers this is. Overall, 3.5 out of 5 from Quite Strong. Uh, as I say, bits of it were dated, but I did still enjoy reading it. Hello, just the one book to wrap up for you today. That is Fragile Things, Short Fictions and Wonders by Neil Gaiman. That actually has some poetry in this as well, as well as a, uh, an, an American Gods novella, which was by far the thing I was the most interested in. As you can see from my tabs, I didn't really take too much away from this. Uh, Neil Gaiman is one of those authors I have a love-hate relationship with, and I think I should like him more than I do. I really enjoyed American Gods, and actually, for the best part of the rest of his stuff, it's been okay at best, you know? This one was a little bit disappointing. I gave it a 3 out of 5. Um, I just didn't think it was a very good collection, to be honest. Like, I can think of... I'd rather be reading Asimov, for example. I'd rather be reading King. I'd rather be reading basically anyone. Graham Greene, I'd rather read him. Like, um, fucking... Who else? Philip Pullman. Like, any, anybody, really. <laughs> Um, it was okay, and the poems to begin with, I did quite enjoy them, but then towards the end they got kind of grating. I think it's also, I don't really like retellings, and a lot of these were just retellings with like Gaiman's own little take on them. And I'm just not a big fan of that, so didn't really enjoy it, but I am glad I ticked it off. And I will be persevering with some more Neil Gaiman, because I want to find one that I like as much as I enjoyed American Gods, so... Yeah. Hello everybody, I have some books to wrap up for you. So I finished reading Creations by Isaac Asimov, George Zabrowski and Martin H. Greenberg. This is a collection of mostly science fiction but there are some non-fiction pieces in there as well, all along the theme of Creations. The science fiction was pretty good although it was kind of just bog standard classic hard sci-fi short stories. Um, but the non-fiction was pretty heavy going, I mean I'll see if I can find some. There were like, you know, mathematical formulas and diagrams and stuff. So, what I ended up doing was I read the, f the fiction, having it as my main book, and then subbed it out as my bedtime book to get through the non-fiction, sort of slowly but surely, and that seemed to work for me. Um, overall, probably like a 3 out of 5. It wasn't particularly my thing, to be honest, but then, I'm not religious, and a lot of this was like science fiction based versions of like the Bible, creation myth and stuff, and even had excerpts from the Bible in here, so, you know, yeah. 
And then I read the Howard Marks Book of Dope Stories. So uh, I've talked about this a little bit in my vlog because this was another bedtime book that I got to about 200 pages from the end and subbed it in as my main book. I think it's like, yeah, 550 odd pages. Howard Marks used to be a drug smuggler. He wrote a book called Mr. Nice, which is all about his time as a weed smuggler, basically. Um, and Mr. Nice was great, but this one, the problem I had with this, it, it was just a bunch of excerpts from stories. But for example, it would have like an excerpt from Sherlock Holmes, which is just about Holmes getting bored and, um, you know, smoking some cocaine or whatever it was that he used to do. I think he injected, did he? No, he didn't inject it, did he? Can't remember what he did. Maybe he dissolved it in water, actually. But anyway, it would have that, but then like not the mystery. So it's like, I would have rather, instead of this having like excerpts from a hundred different stories, it would have been more interesting if it had just had like 10, 15 different complete stories, you know? Um, but yeah, it was all right. Again, another three out of five. Then I read Next by Michael Crichton. So um, this is, I guess, one of the last books, if not the last book that he wrote, because it came out in 2006, I think. Um, and it's basically like a techno thriller that's on the, on the theme of um, like genetic engineering. It has a lot to say about like the patenting of genes and stuff. And there's actually like an outro bit where um, Author's note, yeah, he arrived at the following conclusions. One, stop patenting genes. Two, establish clear guidelines for the use of human tissues. Three, pass laws to ensure that data about gene testing is made public. Four, avoid bans on research. Five, rescind the Bay Dole Act. I guess it does have this agenda, but it did it quite well. It's one of those where the main thrust of this is just this, you know, technological thriller. Um, but then it does ask these questions as well, and you can kind of take those away with you if you want and uh, ask yourself those questions, you know? So overall, probably like a 3.5 out of 5, it was worth reading. And then I read Sphere by Michael Crichton. And um, so this is like, in this one basically, there's like a UFO that's crashed beneath the water and this kind of hybrid team of Navy people and civilian scientists go down to the bottom of the ocean to investigate. And at first it's thought it might be a UFO, then it's thought that it might be like a man-made ship that came back from the future and that proves that time travel is possible. Um, and so yeah, again, interesting enough. Um, to be honest, it's not the kind of premise that I would normally go through, but again, I've just bought this job lot of Michael Crichton books, and I am really into books that deal with technology in general, so um, it's been fun to see, you know, Crichton's take on it. Um, but yeah, this one was probably a little bit slower paced than most. Um, it's still a 3.5 out of 5, but it's kind of a weak one, you know? But it's a sad idea. Yo! Um, I forgot to add one final book to this, which was Rising Sun by Michael Crichton. So this was a thriller, like sort of a murder mystery, but with bits of political espionage thrown in. Um, a lot about like the Japanese and uh, Japanese con uh, companies buying up bits of like Silicon Valley in America and stuff. There were bits of it that were reminiscent of Die Hard as well, and this actually came out after Die Hard. So I think Michael Crichton might have been a little bit inspired by Die Hard. Uh, and that's also based on a book by a guy called Rodney Thorpe, something like that. Uh, Rising Sun, it was okay. There were a lot of like generalizations about Japanese people and Japanese culture. Um, and actually, I think if it was written today, it would be about Chinese people and Chinese culture because there's still that sort of same fear in America of like, oh, the dominant power is no longer going to be um, American business and all of this stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. It was okay. It was like a 3.5 out of 5, but a fairly weak one. It was just alright. So, that is it for September. As you can see, I'm now in my new house. Very nice. Um, more videos coming soon and stuff. So, as always, don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.